Hello, my name is Jacqueline Winspear. Over the past month, I have been honoured to be Alison Busby's Author of the Month. And about a month ago, uh, in another video, you were asked to submit your questions, any questions about the Maisie Jobs series that might have been, you might be curious about, or indeed um, my standalone novel, The Care and Management of Lies. And before we go any further, I'm really sorry about the reflection in my eyes, but it's so hard to get in the right light, and especially as it's a very sunny day outside and I have to have all the blinds closed, and then I realised it was actually the computer that was reflecting into my spectacles. So anyway, let's get going with the, the questions. That's a good one, and it's one that comes up so often for me. Um, where did she originate? Well, she came out of the blue. I was on my way to work and stuck in traffic, horrendous traffic, because it was uh, during one of those very, very rainy, downpour days that we get in winter in California. It never rains in California, it absolutely pours. And um, I was stuck in traffic. It was going nowhere. And so, you know, I guess I started daydreaming. And the next thing I knew, this woman had walked into my life. She walked into my mind's eye as if I was watching a film. She was in the garb of the mid-1920s. She was on her way, I think, to work. That's what I was thinking at the time. And she made her way up through the um, tube station at Warren Street. She was on the old-fashioned clunkety-clunk, clunkety-clunk escalator. She came through a turnstile, not one of those machines that, you know, you flick your Oyster card onto. And, um, you know, she came through, talked to um, a newspaper vendor outside, and then she walked down Warren Street and stood outside a building that was looking a bit shabby. That area could be, it was very shabby in those days. And uh, I know it quite well, not that I lived there then, but I used to work in, in Fitzroy Square, so I know it quite well. That's how I knew it was Warren Street. She stood outside the, uh, this building uh, this house that had been converted and she had rented a couple of rooms there for her new office and basically the whole story just opened up in front of me and uh, actually what I heard very quickly was all this all these car horns behind me because I had held up traffic it had moved on and there I was away in my story and I even heard someone yelling out are you waiting for any particular shade of green lady so I've often called that my moment of artistic grace because that's exactly how it felt. Um, it was such a moment to have a whole story come to me which was in my head by the time I got to work. And um, the thing is I don't think those moments happen in a vacuum and I for one have always been interested in women's history but particularly that generation <clears throat> of women who came of age during the Great War. So many of them remained um, unmarried and uh, had to forge a life alone, given the sheer numbers of men, young men of marriageable age, who were lost during that war. And those women blazed a trail. Um, obviously, there were those who floundered, but so many of them, they just got on with it and they showed such resilience and endurance. It was incredibly inspiring to me. So hardly surprising that... Um, Maisie Dobbs was one of that generation. And regarding a series, no, I never expected a series. However, as I was writing the first novel, there were ideas and images and pieces of dialogue that were coming to me that I knew just didn't fit. So I just wrote them out and put them on a file on my computer desktop and marked it fragments. So when my editor phoned me after Maisie Dobbs went into production and said, well, Jackie, what about the next book in the series? And I thought, try not to panic because you don't know what, you're, you don't know what to say. Um, but I said I'd call her back. And instead, I went straight to that fragments file, pulled the lot out, printed them out, stuck them all over the floor and moved them around. And I realized I had more books. So, yes, pretty soon. I mean, I, I knew I had a series, but not at the outset. I enjoy every character I write. I love Priscilla. I think she's a terrific foil for um, Maisie. You know, sometimes I think I'm, I'm more inside Priscilla's head because I'm, I'm, I'm prodding Maisie a lot with Priscilla. And I think I really enjoy her character. But I enjoy Billy Beale. I love, um, you know, um, Frankie Dobbs and uh, Morris and all the other 
sort of a, let, let, let's say regular characters I, I, I really enjoy it. otherwise I, I wouldn't be writing it so I'm, I'm thrilled to have made their acquaintance and to be able to write about them and regarding in books into audiobook uh, I have a confession I, I don't listen to the audiobooks because I have this is going to sound, I, I have those voices in my head I know what I hear I know how I believe each of my characters sounds I don't want to be distracted by someone else giving them sounds that perhaps you know are, are, are quite different from how I hear them um, so it's, it's a bit like you know I never watch these videos because I don't like the sound of my own voice I don't like uh, I can't listen to the audios but I know people love them so I'm I'm really blessed that's wonderful very fortunate in that I, I know my settings quite intimately in that you know I was born and raised in Kent um, I lived in the home counties I didn't come to the United States until I was 35 so you know I know my country and I go back there a lot I spend a lot of time in the UK and I know London very well I used to work there my parents originally came from London and um, although they've both passed away now in the earlier books with the earlier books I was able to call them up and ask them how a certain area looked before the war because of course the Second World War decimated so much of, of London and then when it was rebuilt I mean it just looked quite different so I was able to ask what does this area look like or what does that area look like and I go to other places you know I went to Munich to um, when I was doing research for Journey to Munich and that was extraordinary especially going to um, the Dachau concentration camp um, I've uh, I remember with my late parents you know going down to Dungeness in Kent and just walk which I know quite well anyway but I wanted to refresh my memory and there we were sort of tramping across the shingle on a very windy day and that was um, research for Messenger of Truth so yes I, I tend to go to places and if I'm writing a place that I don't, haven't personally been to. I do a lot of research, but I, I also try to keep exposure to that place a minimum. At a minimum, I've been to um, uh, Gibraltar, um, which was sort of background uh, for a dangerous place, and uh, into Spain and went to various places that are featured there. Um, you know that were were very important during the Spanish Civil War. And needless to say, on uh, several occasions, I have walked the battlefields um, of the Somme and Ypres. I've, I've driven around those areas. I've walked across no man's land. And I have stood and, you know, held my hand on my heart for all the many um, men. And indeed, there were women who were killed during the Great War. So, yes, I, I do quite a bit of uh, traveling around for my novels. The great thing about being the creator of this series is that if you left someone behind and you kind of miss them, you can bring them back again, which is what I've done. And regarding Priscilla's niece, suffice it to say, watch this space. And especially in the next book in the series, which is coming out in March 2021. And uh, if you're looking for Priscilla's niece, I, you'll, you'll be happy. The, the first question is about writing about Maisie's early years as an apprentice. And I would love to do that. And in fact, I've, I've kind of already got notes ready to write that. Um, but as you can imagine, the, uh, the, the the essence uh, is really time <laughs> and um, I'm very involved with writing um, you know uh, the, the the series as it exists but I I'm pretty sure I'm going to come to back to that and I hope sooner rather than later and it's really interesting that that same reader brought up the issue of you know people perhaps living together when we think that they didn't in those days sexual relationships at the time and so on of course the freedom that I have is that I'm writing now so I can write about those issues um, people writing uh, in in that era era they had to be a, take a little bit more care however it's not that it didn't happen it did happen um, certain writers themselves were living as they might have said then living in sin um, and were certainly cohabiting or a part-time if not a full-time basis and you can certainly look back into the lives of someone like Dorothy Sayers 
Um, but she couldn't actually write about it because she lived in a different era, but I can. But the interesting thing is that whilst there was a certain segment of, of uh, let's say, Bohemian society that certainly would cohabit, that certainly had open sexual relationships or another, you, you really couldn't get away with that if you were in the working classes. Not only uh, for young women was there the risk of pregnancy and not finding anyone to help you if you became pregnant, but um, there was definitely, you know, a stigma. You couldn't have got away with that. But there were other things to look at, you know, the other, you know, if you think of the, there were many women um, uh, who after the First World War, there were, you know, if you wanted companionship for your rest of your life, the chances were that you might, you might go and live with another woman. It didn't have to be a sexual relationship, but perhaps some of those were sexual relationships. They were in different types of partnerships, you know, and no one can blame anyone for wanting companionship. And I remember when I was a child, for example, just up the street, there was this man and woman that had lived together for many, many years. And the gentleman was referred to as her lodger. Well, I think that was another way of saying, well, he just happens to live there, but no one, you know, obviously wanted to recognize that he might have been anything else to her. Certainly when you heard them having a row, you could believe that he was more than a lodger. But I think you have to sort of read between the lines and also understand that I'm writing at a different time when I have, you know, I, I am, have the liberty and the freedom to be able to write about relationships in a different way. And um, certainly with Maisie Dobbs, and I don't want to give the game away for people who haven't got that far in the series. Um, yes, she's in, a, she's in a relationship, but she's also very careful that there are separate rooms in that same house, however else it might be. So um, I think it's just a, a question that I, I treat it differently, but I am at liberty to do so. Do you know, here's what is really rewarding. And that, and, and I have experience of writing a, a standalone novel with the care and management of lies. It was not part of the series. It's not a mystery. It's, although it's set in the Great War, it's a different kind of book. And so I have a different relationship with the characters. But here's the wonderful thing about writing a series. And that is that um, I think it's more organic. It's more as we have a relationship with um, another human being. So let me explain what I mean by that. If you, for example, met someone, uh, let's say at a party um, or at a friend's house or something, you get talking and you, you think, oh, this is a nice person. I'd like to get to know them better. So you then go out for a coffee and then maybe you have dinner and maybe you go for a walk. And over time, friendship grows. And we all know that when, at the beginning of a friendship, you don't suddenly tell everyone everything about you. You reveal yourselves to each other over time. And so that's how a relationship grows and changes. So with a series, it's very similar. There's a lot I know about my characters, but it's really interesting as, as much as I create the characters and I create their lives moving forward because my novels move on over time and my characters grow and change. But as much as I am the creator, so they are revealing themselves to me. So it becomes a really rich experience as a writer to be able to take um, your characters through different experiences, through different a different era, for a different era. So you're going from particularly in wartime, you're one year to the next is, is things can change rapidly, as we know, because, you know, I'm writing this just as things are sort of starting to loosen up following the lockdown and uh, the COVID-19 virus. And I live in California and we were one of the first places to go into lockdown. So, you know, think how things changed from just six months ago. So um, I'm really, I really love writing a series for that reason, that I can explore character in a very rich and meaningful way. That is a question with a lot of answers. But here's what I hold dear and what I have seen uh, in my late parents and in that generation and in the generation immediately after the war. And that is something that is 
an inspiration to us all and it is the qualities of resilience and endurance at the very worst of times that people knew terror that I can't even imagine, you know, firestorms through the cities um, and, you know, so many restrictions and, you know, there was, and it wasn't all laughter down the shelters and things like that. I mean, the fact that, um, I mean, so many people were killed the first two years of the war, far more civilian deaths than military deaths. And people came to the other side of it and they carried on. And I know everybody talks about the keep calm and carry on, but I think there's this resilience, this, the nature of uh, the, the ability to endure is inspirational. That is something I take away from the, the history of the Second World War. I think I've been asked every single question, to tell you the truth, about um, the eras about which I write, because I also have a newsletter which goes out several times a year, and usually around the time that a book is being published or just beforehand. And I, I write about the history, the historical underpinnings of my novels. And those um, newsletters are archived on my, on my website. So there's a lot of answers there that people find about my work, my research, what drives me and what inspires me. And I think one thing to say here is that I actually write other things as well. Um, I'm an essayist. I write op-ed. Um, I've written op-ed columns. And um, one of my essays was published, for example, on LitHub, which is the, uh, you can go online to the LitHub website. And uh, I wrote a, about women war correspondents. And war correspondents, and particularly war correspondents, is a subject that I'm incredibly interested in. And uh, again, it goes back to sort of the, the, the bravery shown by so many men and women, and also that desire to, to bear witness to the truth of war. I, I try not to get distracted, but going off on a tangent, here's what I think about the whole notion of going off on a tangent, that I'm, I'm prepared to go down that path. If some, another idea comes to me, I'll follow it because I, there's something else at play and uh, I, you can call it what you will. But I'll give you an example of that. When I first started to write uh, Pardonable Lies, I had this whole opening scene in my head. I knew exactly what I was going to write. Maisie is introduced to this uh, man and he wants her to find out if his son is still alive. And um, he was uh, an aviator during the war and he wants to know, you know, he, they received a message um, after, you know, obviously during the war saying that he was missing. Uh, they never received confirmation that he was actually dead. And this man absolutely believes that his son is dead, but his wife, who has recently died, always maintained that her son was still alive. And she wanted to know the truth. And she made him swear on, when she was on her deathbed, she made her husband swear that he would find out the truth. So I had this all planned out in my head. I sat down to write the opening chapter and something completely different came out. And it was a scene where Maisie is called to Vine Street Police Station where a young, very young girl has just been pulled in for murder and for murder of a man. And she is very unclean. Her, uh, she's, uh, she looks ill, not well. And instead, what Maisie does is and Maisie was asked to come in and question her as a woman, uh, a psychologist and an investigator. And instead, Maisie goes to her knees. She asks for a bowl of hot water and a towel. And she washes the young girl's legs and arms for her. And there unfolds the girl's story. And what that allowed me to do was to explore, as the book went on, the the grief that Maisie feels about the loss of her mother when she was about that girl's age. And uh, so I explored the story of the aviator, but also Maisie's personal story. So once again, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Look forward to, to hearing from you in the future, I hope. Take care. Bye-bye.